I'm going to type start. Oh, oh yeah. beat me to it, John. I, I just did start. Um, welcome okay. to uh, chapter seven of the book, uh, or the lesson seven uh, of the practical deep learning. Uh, last week, Aaron did uh, great work talking through random forests, and much like he 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 mentioned last week, is things seem to be scattered around in different lessons. But the main focus of the book this week was on the understanding of collaborative filtering which is used in recommendation systems. Uh, there are resources for uh, the road to the top, uh, part three and four within Kaggle, uh, and some conversations around cross entropy. And forewarning, this is not me searching uh, you know, that. That's actually a resource down here. Um, but he did provide <laughs> the video and the book itself, uh, uh, Excel files to kind of help break down uh, what the what the collaborative filterings and embeddings looks like, as well as understanding cross entropy uh, through there. Uh, some of the key takeaways is really that collaborative filtering itself is, as he kindly put it farther down in the book, is you're basically using common sense here in a certain way of you know you you have a user that interacts with a product or an item is what the actual term is called, and the um, and so whether they interacted with an item or used an item, then they can find other users who have interacted or um, done something with the item to ultimately recommend uh, other pr similar products, uh, sorry, other products that those similar users have um, interacted with. Uh, so he breaks it down here with the movies, for example. So a lot of us probably have streamed at some point or at least watched a movie to get an idea of like, you know, when you're looking to search for a new movie there's just that endless scroll of every possible way so a lot of things to uh, get there is you know making sure the right content is uh you know for the user so that they would uh get that and that's where they're going to be recommending the, the movie and one of the challenges that he brought up further down was that um what do you do with new users who you don't have any information about and so there was two ways that this data can come in. You could ask for the data when someone signs up. So if you've ever signed up for like Spotify or one of the streaming services, they usually say, hey, pick top five uh, genres you like and then let us know. And so you're basically creating that initial, what that user's uh, reactions are to those different ones. And then kind of comparing that to either uh, like a target nor, uh, representative uh, user somewhere in the data set and then base it off of that uh, situation. Or if this is a, a user who's watched a lot of things and wants the recommendations, you'd be able to um, see what they have watched, what they uh, thought of uh, in this case, uh, uh, like through ratings and other things, what they thought of those, and then compare that to other users to find similar uh, movies that ranked well between those two users. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just a little confusing if I'm messing that up, but uh, the main thing here is basically how do we recommend these things? And and there is it is built off of a lot of assumptions. Um, and, uh, you know, there is some challenges, uh, with bootstrapping it because there is a lot of things that could really, um, uh, go wrong. Uh, and it, it's not something that's obvious in the data initially, um, until something actually happens. So like if a website was doing well and then all of a sudden their whole user base of like 70% of the user base dropped off over the last three or four days, um, you know, that that was a an, an issue there that wasn't present in the actual uh, models that we'll be building. Uh, so it, that was an example of some of the concerns where, and if you're concerned about AI taking over, the human element going in there and say basically, what would that look like where I have these certain situations that could become potential issues and be able to work those in, such as uh, over-representation. So, People who, uh, he mentioned people who watch anime seem to watch a ton of it and are very active in the user ratings. So any kind of top 
whatever list tend to be overrepresented by anime because of that a small group of people are uh, really swaying this whole model. Uh, they also mentioned the um, where it, your actual values can be tweaked one way or the other. And then there's also some lesser challenges that we talked through a lot of the things that we consider in here is understanding the bias. So some people are just really grumpy and don't like anything. And some people are really like, you know, five stars and the you know thing says, you know, they it was broken when it was it was shipped or something and I got it and like messing up. But the idea here is that you kind of want to be able to treat these um as factors to be able to create a cross tab that feeds into this cross um uh, this uh collaborative filtering filtering uh model. And so that's kind of just an overview of where we're going. We're basically understanding how do we get from a simple, relatable recommendation of what movie should I watch next? Or Netflix says what movie would you would like more likely to watch next? Um, and the idea here is that we are gonna use um, these latent factors, which essentially is gonna be built off of um, the uh, for each user, it's going to be an array or uh, actually a, a matrix of their uh, score from negative one to one of certain categories that are there to see how positive, how negative. So in this one, they said, okay, if they like action, uh, that would be one. Sci-fi would be another. So as you go through the ratings for that person, you'll get an idea of where do they favor science fiction? Do they favor science fiction and action? Uh, or are they kind of neutral? Uh, it was interesting to see farther down that um, the, yes, you can get the recommendation. You could have just done that by filtering uh, by rating or something for a movie to see like, you know, what are the top movies or so on. But understanding there's other things that you can extract out of this model for uh, of interest. So for example, if somebody really likes sci-fi full of action, they would have a one. If they really, so that would be a high match. And if they don't like the stuff, it'd be very low. And there are situations where, and it was a graphic later, that there will be ones where the movies, no matter what people like watching don't like that that movie so if you are somebody who uh normally watches uh, favors sci-fi or action or something like that these are the movies that still are not well received by people who like sci-fi or whatever the one is so basically that's a way of kind of generalizing bad movies um on the other side of it is the one where it's not just sci-fi fans that don't like these movies it's everybody across the the spectrum and you know if you normally if you normally watch this um genre that this movie is in and you like it but that genre you're not going to like this movie uh that's going to be the one where it's more specific to the one the one uh factor representation where the other one is more general basically uh, across the board, everyone doesn't like this movie. And we'll see what that looks like and how that is interpreted based off of the findings. Anything you all wanted to add or before we kind of start looking through it? Nope, not right now. Yeah, feel free to hop in or correct me if I misspeak. Yeah, so we, we end up with a uh, data that was pulled from the movie database um, that's linked here. And I forgot to bring it up here. Um, so this is some, he recommends to actually run this on the full, at the time was 25 million, now it's 32 million. Uh, but this is just a, uh, a, a, a hundred thousand of them for an example. It runs fairly quickly. Uh, usually uh, each iteration of the, of the models, it takes about 10 or 15 seconds when I was running it, but that bit might vary. So looking at it, we really just see we have users, a, an ID for 
movie, which we can get by uh, combining them, and a rating and a timestamp. And what we can do with this, so each user is an individual user, no concern about personal identifiable data because it's just a uh, anonymous ID. Um, the movie, movie ID uh, can be easily looked up to see what the title of this movie actually was. And then the ratings would be as one to five, uh, ranking of five being really liked or one being really bad. Uh, and the timestamp we're actually not going to use at this point. And he introduces a way that we can uh, represent this rather than in, in the uh, form as like a, a, a tabular form as like a, a data frame is actually created in a way that is cross tabulated, where on the column is that unique user ID and across the top is the movie ID. And how you would read this is as you go across the rows for that user, they rated the movie number 27 as three, 49 as five, and so on. So for user 14, as you read across the rows, you would get all the ratings that that user had provided. Now, if we look vertically down, so for example, in, if we start at movie ID 27, we can see that this would be the averages across all the users, or sorry, the rating across all the users, but we're missing some. There are blank values in here, and that is something that what we're recommending them for. The idea here yeah, is that- and I would I'd say in the real world, uh, this matrix would be much more uh, sparse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, this is quite quite dense, right? Yes. and. And that's the thing that we're really trying to understand and answer with the recommendation is without knowing or without them actually having interacted with this, would we be able to recommend it based off of what we uh, find is likely that they would represent it based off of similar users and ratings across different movies and so on. So the goal here, and as mentioned, is that this is very full. This is again subset. Be kind of interesting to see on the larger um, 25 million. We'll probably see a lot less of it. But this is a picture, so this is actually the uh, the data we have. Yeah. And the other cool thing that was interesting about this is we don't actually need to know anything about these movies. We don't need to know anything about these users. The the cross filtering and um, turning this into a deep learning model that actually finds those relationships for us. So even though we don't necessarily know that movie 49 is say, um, what's out right now, uh, or a famous movie, uh, Star Wars or something, uh, Return of the Jedi, um, but the data itself through the uh, latent factors and the relationships should be able to uh, kind of inform us that, hey, this is likely going to be a movie that's an action movie because of the um, how the users reviewed and their latent factors. And we're actually going to be creating those latent factors based off of a dot product um, between two uh, matrices of random, starting with random values for each of those factors. Um, and then basically, we're going to be uh, doing the cross multiplication from of that with um, the actuals for it. And so again, we don't need to know like, hey, this is a sci-fi movie, we, we don't need this, and th which is great because it reduces a lot of the, um, you know, the, a lot of data that we don't need to move forward with or you know, add other, other features or anything like that. So again, the, the factors are gonna be negative one to one with a positive number, stronger matches, negative numbers, weaker ones. So as it gets larger, up to one, the categories would represent whichever, sorry about that, whichever uh, one they had selected. So if their categories are science fiction, action, old movies, and uh, there was five of them, so we'll have to see what the other one is, uh, we would be able to say that the movie itself 
in this case, The Last Skywalker, is represented by that latent factor. So even though we don't know that it's Last Skywalker, each one of these movies will have a different um, representation for that movie. And this is what it would look like. So of those three, and I think I saw this one, it's basically saying that it's very science fiction-y, it has a lot of action, but not much, it's not a very old movie. Uh, compare that to the original ones, it probably would be very similar here, but this would probably be a larger number because they're very old. Very not. Very not old. Yes. Very not old means like one would be new. Is that correct? That like that sounds like new to me. Yeah. So that wouldn't seem like it would make sense then because it's only came out like like actually I apologize. It very well could make sense based off of the um. The fact that maybe that what did that come out like 2018 that there's been a lot of content explosion since then so maybe the movies that we've selected um but yeah so anyways um it is lower on the very not old so even though it's a recent movie it's not a high match on what people consider to be recent and that that makes sense because of the content uh the amount of content and the number of platforms and everything uh definitely um there was a lot more content out starting around that 2021 mark for a bit, for a while. Okay, so this represents the movie, and this represents the user and how they actually um, uh, rated would rate that movie. Um, and by simply multiplying um, them and then adding or essentially taking the dot product, you get um, a way to fill in that table fairly simply. So for that movie, for that user, if they hadn't seen it yet, they likely would score a 2.142 or two point, uh, probably a two on that. So it's probably not one that you would see recommended to them uh, for there. So that's the, at its core, the most basic concept of it is you take what the movie is represented as with the user's um, scoring, multiply them together, sum them with dot product, and you can get a rough value of what to expect for there. Now, the reason why we don't necessarily do it this way throughout here, as I mentioned, is it's not really uh, uh, efficient. It takes up a lot of time and uh, memory usage. So there's ways that we can take this more simple approach and make it uh, run a, a lot less efficient. And so the next part's really getting into understanding um, how we can learn what the latent factors actually are to fill in when we don't have them. Mm -hmm. that's where they he brings up the excel sheet and how i understood it here was that starting with a random set of values for each of those factors you'll then take you'll optimize them with the gradient descent based off of what actually was in the data and that will allow us to create predictions of what this person would be represented as in those factor scores. And this would be our prediction for what this movie, the movie that's being used here, would be for our um, movies. So instead of it being less Skywalker equals the values, we would have basically saying that 72 would be represented by these factor values. 
this user 293 would be the here. So what we end up with is uh, being able to um, multiply these um, based on the optimization for our predictions using the, uh, the dot product. And so where step one if I, uh, lays out here is initialize randomly some parameters. Just the random numbers. Step two is doing the dot product, which is actually what, what the prediction is. And then you're going to calculate the loss. And he mentioned in here that it's, uh, you know, for the most part, you can select um, any kind, uh, any of the reasonable ones. He selected mean square, squared error. Um, so as we go further down, that's what we're going to be using and seeing throughout the other ones. But he did say, you know, any that we you could use. If, if I remember correctly from the video, didn't Jeremy say like the number of factors that you're choosing is kind of arbitrary and he really just kind of made something up? <laughs> uh, so, some sort of, he had some intuition and made it into an equation and now apparently people are citing his his intuition, like the equation that he created from his intuition um, as something like official and right, it's making its way into all this academic research. Was it this this week's uh, video? Yeah, or... yeah, I, heard, I remember that too. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Because that was one of the questions from the audience, right? That got back was like, well, how do you know how many factors to choose? And he really didn't have a good answer. He was just like, yeah, we we I made something up and I put it in fast AI, but it works well. <laughs> yeah, and and he he does uh, touch upon that in here about it's fairly simple when. You know, like a rating, you could just say it's one, two, three, four, five. But how do you represent something that's a science fiction e amount and things? So, it, in in here before, he just basically said some examples that you could consider for your recommendation. One are you know the genre, the actions, and so on through it. But yeah, I miss I missed that one. Um, but it might have been later on where I didn't get to within it. <clears throat> Yeah, it was uh, it was towards the end of the the video, if I remember correctly. So, in all of this here, even if you're not a huge math person, this is really the critical difference between the base model and the more simplistic uh, model that does the same thing in a quicker way and the more recommended way to do it this uh, than just to do to that product everyone uh, every time. Uh, so basically what it, it, it does is it does the derivative and the gradient descent optimizer the um, all in one. So we don't have to do this manually for each one. So this is the movie for our our data that we're actually looking at and you can see we have the movie id and then the string format for the title um and what we can do is add on to our existing data frame from above the title so we have labels and we can use those later for the more of the human and in, uh interpretability on the charts and we can get additional um uh, information about it now, in here, the default setting for uh, um, data loader is it takes the first column, second column, and then the third column. But in our case, what we want to use for column uh, two is not the movie ID, but the type. So you can have it like this and then overwrite those three defaults. But if you had the three that you wanted in order, then it would be the same first, second, third. So he does say the limitation in PyTorch is that you can't represent cross tabs in there. And you can't um, 
script the term. I'll get to it when we get there. There's other things that we can't do uh, in PyTorch that we would like to, uh, such as working with matrices. Um, or yeah, we'll get there. I don't want to say wrong things right now. Um, yep. Yeah, so we have five factors, and we have uh, a user, the user. So we get a number of users using up in there, and we have the number of titles in there. And from that, we're going to create two um, factors here um, of the latent factors uh, using the torch with a random number for the user and the number of factors, uh, movies, and factors. So to get a combination between the two. So if we do this um, and we want to see how to combine that, what it would look like for a particular combination, that's where we can't actually do um, looking up in an index inside of deep learning models. So they, they're on the matrix multiplication activation function, but we need a, an easier way to search for an index inside of a matrix. Um, that's there. And the way to get around that is one uh, applying a one hot encoded vector representing the index that you want to look for. So in this case, um, using one hot, let's say the index three, from the number of users, we get that value for that one. And we can get for the user three in our data, this is the um, latent factors for that specific user. And that's what he highlights here is using it this way from the index segment of, a, uh, of an array. And then looking at it this way inside of the deep learning, we get the same values. This is what's recommended because um, it's more efficient and there's a lot less manu uh, like iterative doing one at a time and splitting it between different texts. And that leads into the, the part where instead of doing it that approach, we are going to be introduced to embedding. And essentially, it's a shortcut where it does the um, uh, multiplying of the one hot encoded matrix uh, and, and get the derivative all inside of one. So you end up with what's called an embedding matrix. And this is where he talks about if you think of like a, a, a problem for computer vision of, of pictures, there's quantitative or empirical uh, values there that represent each of those already given to you. So RGB, there's a numerical representation for every combination between those. That's already there. What makes this a bit more of a challenge is we don't actually have a way to characterize what a user is and what a movie is in the same capacity. And that's what embeddings are. They start with um, making a vector for each of our users in our movies, and they're going to actually turn the tensor um, into a learnable parameter. So predictions to targets, and then do the gradient descent. Uh, or SGD or any other optimizer. Do you all have any suggestions on other optimizers or thoughts on that one? I, I don't know if I have a thought on on the best optimizer. I, I know that, and I don't mean to to take us off track here, but uh, you know, I, I realize deep learning is used for recommendation. It's it's been been out there as a popular uh, architecture, right, for doing this for for a number of years now. I, because my question is, you know, why why is deep learning better than traditional 
methods like matrix factorization, right? I mean, because because recommenders have existed for a long time. This is tabular data. It's structured data. Um, I, I didn't read this chapter either. I watched the video and I don't remember that him talking about that. It just, it's not clear to me why I'd want to use this approach versus something else. And I, I guess what I got from this is that, and he says in here as many times as he's run these models, there's always something interesting that is found in the data by doing deep learning that we don't see. Um, so example of this one, which is moving a little ahead. And I, I, I believe this was kind of where he was getting at why this is better than just looking through the numbers and, you know, assigning value is we start to see other um, concepts here. And I think I, I don't think I skipped it yet. Oh, maybe I did. There's this one, um, which starts to kind of, the colors here are different. Mm -hmm together that it, it found within deep learning and then I thought sorry if I'm giving people a headache I where is the one he had a really good one of about like the movies that are just bad oh here they are okay it was a list so if you look at this and these are just movies that had very low bias or that people didn't like them um that uh for that category that they tend to they say basically this should be a, a a very good match based off of their preferences for these types of things but they don't like it. so it's something <laughs> that it, it's, it's 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 not something that even if it met the criteria you wanted you would not like it Whereas this this side of uh, kind of understanding the bias and uh, interpretation of this, this is a situation where if you tend to not even watch, say, action movies or science fiction movies, even though you don't watch those um, genres, these are movies that you likely would still enjoy. Um, so there's two. Th these are ways that are starting to be, allow for more of that interpretation based off of the findings and the bias. And then he kind of comes in here um, a little bit further and talks about, you know, that utilizing uh, PCA with with the output of this, we can start um, uh, you know, looking at what the movies look like based off of those components. So after the PCA components, we kind of start to see, um, you know, movies that are one type like the big blockbusters versus others and so on that was my interpretation of that that could be missing some stuff but uh i think it was really about not only are you getting you know kind of the the fact uh the 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 latent factors uh optim optimized you're then also able to explore beyond that to answer other questions um by extracting from the findings of the deep learning model. But yeah, that was, a, that was a great one. That was what I was trying to say in the beginning. I didn't say specifically why I use the deep learning, but um, I uh, was talking about like some of the ways that you can pull the information out. Right, okay. you're saying you, you get feedback that maybe you wouldn't get in a traditional model yeah, so you wouldn't you wouldn't know what a movie you don't need to know the uh, the details pretty much for it to figure out what the details are mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Um, where were we? So we have our we can't do the cross tabulation. Um, we have our data loaders. We uh, created a torch here, so we've established that instead of manually. What do, what do you mean when you say you can't do the cross tabulation? You can't do it inside of uh, um, PyTorch. Oh, directly. Yeah. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Sorry. That's what I meant. It's like you, you can't have that yeah. same uh, view there. So the idea is here we'd have to look at matrix representations of each user, each uh, 
movie in this case and do a dot product that way which gotcha. is not optimal um so embedding is the next part of that um process which is what leads us into the next one do you all you all go to python like understand the object oriented programming stuff or is that worth kind of talking about what these are used for I'm yeah gonna... I'm, I'm yeah I'm, I'm fine all right yeah so the idea here is that basically when you um call the module here um you know then you you have all of your attributes that um there but you can also run the the the, the uh, function when that's called as well um and so here's where we're going to start looking at it did say that because they could be different sizes there's actually ways to look at like what the suggested size is for each one um so that's one difference uh, as well and it goes a little bit more detail of like how this is actually set up uh, in more detail on that um so when we have our dot product we come up to the class it inherits um everything from the module and then basically is saying is that um you know, he basically fills these in but you're going to be running this forward where you're grabbing the user at information movie information and returning back um that dot matrix representation and then we will use a learner class here so we're going to fit one cycle through and we see that we have our training loss which was the mean square error and our validation here and again it only took a few uh actually a little bit um so we're pretty quickly here now now it's talking more into actually optimizing this process so actually forcing the predictions to only be between certain values so that they could take any of the values that are um, possible there uh, so he recommends based off the sigmoid range to add a little bit more than the five but that will help um, it be a little bit better to control what the values can be between and we can see here that the training loss this looks like it's cut in half, maybe a little bit more. And now we're getting into understanding the biases that are in there. So basically people who are generally more positive or negative. And the idea here is that we want to create um, a way to add, create a single number that we can basically add to the scores and for the user and the movie uh, to handle where people are just very sci-fi oriented or something like that, you don't have to um, uh, you can differentiate, sorry, you can differentiate between whether it's because of the users just are biased towards being you know negative towards everything but sci-fi versus actually just bad movies that led back into why the deep learning because um you're know, basically uh, reducing the coefficients here uh, so we'll go and we'll go back into that but um that leads into the weight decay and the weight decay is basically some uh where you take the um the l2 uh, regularization that's where you actually will take the adding to your loss function the sum of all the weights squared um and with when we go to do the gradient descent incur uh, contribution to them will make them as small as possible right so it's it's like ridge regression right and uh here's a uh, maybe a silly question about the term bias here um i feel like I'm conceptualizing it in two different ways. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about like, I have a bias in that 
I really like sci-fi movies, right? That's that's one way. But then I'm thinking about neural networks and the term bias is used to describe like an intercept term. And I just want to <laughs> make sure I'm clear when we use the the term bias in this context, is it really the former where we're, we're, we're trying to adjust for, for kind of um, do unique characteristics of certain users or... Or, yeah, or... you're basically okay. trying to adjust for those kind of things. Uh, and this is a key point, so I'm glad you brought this up, is by just adding that to the loss function itself, um, we start to see that our validation starts getting worse as we go through, indicating overfitting. Um, and that's because of there's not an option for us to, for data augmentation uh, in this case. So I have to use some other ways to regularize it. And that's where you take the that bias from the coefficient and create it, uh, you utilize a weight decay um, so that you can uh, limit this growth of that, those coefficients that you've carried forward. And that's, uh, what he's showing here is, you know, at, with the overfitting, because, you know, the values can take on so many different things, you get these really overfit ways to represent the data. But if you were to limit these, it does, um, or not, uh, reduce the size of the coefficients. Um, we'll, we'll be able to get more from it. So, High parameters for um, that will be over complex, overfitting, and then limiting our weights from growing too much. It's going to hinder the training, uh, but we'll have a better general model. And that was kind of the one of the first sentences in the beginning is that uh, a general solution to the recommendation problem is a collaborative filtering. And what that comes into here is now we have the loss plus the weight decay times the sum square of the parameters, which this is right here is represented at uh, by, this is the different uh, the 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 um, derivative that we want to take. And a derivative of something squared is going to be two times it, and that's where we get this. And there's a one step further here that you could just make your weight decay twice as large and remove this multiply by two uh, options. Since we uh, are creating that parameter ourselves, we could just make this twice as large. Um, times here. And instead of creating a whole bunch of equals here of large values being added and so on, we can just uh, add, add them as we go. And when we, by doing that with the same kind of the approach for the bias and the weighting, we can see that our uh, validation does not show, at least in this, uh, evidence of overfitting like the other one did at this point. So the next part here is redoing everything that we just did without using the dot product bias class. And the note here is that we actually need to add the tensor to as a parameter because that's not done already. Um, and that's something that we would have to do. We're basically using it as a trainable parameter um, as we go through. Uh, right. So this is how you would do that with the random initialization. You have there. And then without 
the embedding, we have all of that in one dot product bias class. And it now, see, we're comparing, did we get roughly around what we saw previously? And I think it's around the, uh, might be a little, little bit, but generally, yes. And then this is where we're going to start looking at actually the interpretation of them. We touched about this a little bit earlier, uh, but the concept here was understanding like what can bias tell you. So one means very well matched for that and negative one is there. First one being is generally speaking, if you watch this genre of say sci-fi and you usually like sci-fi, even though that this is a match as a sci-fi movie, you will not like it. So indication of a genre of bad movie. Where on the flip side of that, if you don't even watch sci-fi movies, you'll still probably like Star Wars. So these are ones that are just generally good movies um, or ones that you would enjoy even if it doesn't match your um, your normal rating. And this is where, in this paragraph right here is where he talks about, um, you know, we could have just sorted the movies by their average rating. It tells us something much more interesting. Um, so that's kind of where that deep learning aspect of it was going. And if we take that a step further and uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the, the de uh, decomposition here, the PCA, principal component analysis, we end up with the, uh, the kind of the, the eigenvectors between the two, and we can start to see some interesting things here as well. And even down here, he says, it seems like it could have found this or this that's represented in here. Even it still takes some interpretability and understanding of hey, I recognize some things in here that are similar. And the idea is that you would recommend that if they liked, say, Groundhog Day, and they were interested in the same, whatever number this is, you'd probably go with McGuire here. And that gets us into what the actual recommendation is, which is um, the use of the distance. The idea here is you want to reduce the distance between uh, or return back the recommendations that have the least distance uh, between them. This section right here is specifically on the doing what we just did above, but using the fast AI library specifically. But here's where we got into the simple Pythagorean theorem. We can basically look at all the coordinate distances between them and figure out their um, you know their, their distance. And it's basically saying model sim uh, movie similarity is defined by similarity of users that like the movies. So basically those vectors can define the similarity. And we can put in a movie. And from that, we can figure out which of those reduces that error, uh, sorry, that distance. Uh, and in this case, if they put Silence of the Lambs, they got Meet John Doe. I don't think I've seen either of those. I've at least heard of this one. I don't, I haven't heard of that one. Um, and that's how we would approach it if we already had the data available for us to provide this. The next part is getting into bootstrapping, which is talking more about ways to still have meaningful recommendations even if you have no information about the user. And it talks about, you know, one way that you could do it is by taking a mean, uh, and then kind of like above is like, you could do it this way, this way is a little bit better. Uh, it did kind of talk about, um, you know, you may find a user that represents average taste. So maybe there's some, what you would consider a typical user um, profile for the, factor as a baseline, and then it will adjust from there. Or you can just simply ask people their preferences up front to 
generate those and then utilize that there. Um, and he does bring some cautions in here about using deep learning in this overall, which is um, small amount of enthusiastic or uh, ones here are going to mess up. You're basically going to give the references for everybody because they're like, hey, anime movies are great no matter what. And people are going to start getting recommended those, even though they're not really representative of the other one. You want to make sure you have a representative sample because um, that changes the direction of your recommendation. And he mentions that this type of bias coming from people attracting people to the platforms who have similar tastes, that this bias tends to be exponential. And it, it was kind of confusion of like these kind of feedback loops and everything can happen so quickly and it's generally hidden in here. And that's why a self-reinforcing system like this, sorry, um, needs to have those feedbacks and monitoring and that human understanding of, okay, what would it look like for you know, a group of people that would put too much bias towards a certain genre or something like that? So that was the probabilistic matrix factorization. Now we're getting into the deep learning. So this I think was originally what, like, why, why would we just wanna stop here? Why don't we just stop here and then go into the actual deep learning component of it? And as I scroll through it, looking, looking at it, um, well, that's not a lot of code. <laughs> Uh, it, it was a simplistic model, uh, more intuitive. It's pretty much letting it determine all that under the hood. We didn't have to, um, you know, build out those components each time, create the stuff. It's all found basically through a, uh, similar to the mini neural net that I used a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, I think the point he was making there is that Originally, he just used the dot product. Well, we could take the embedding vectors and do some other function with them, right? So, what, well, what's the tool we have for generating arbitrary functions? Is a neural network. So, it, the neural network would do some kind of arbitrary function, some kind of a universal function on the two embeddings, and try to compute um, the predict the ratings that way, right? Um, and it turns, like you say, it turns out that um, all it does is use the tabular learner under the hood. And that, that's something um, that's actually the next chapter where we covered previously as well. And um, actually, I don't know if he did, he cover the tabular learner very much. I don't know if he did in the previous, the Sorry. previous. No, I mean, in the previous, like there's a whole chapter about tabular learner. That's a, and how it works, but. Well, I mean um, the Titanic data set, right? Yeah, that, tabular. yeah. But he mostly did forests on it. Right. So I can't remember now. Right. But we also did a neural net on it as okay, well. Okay. I mean, I read the chapter, so I confused, like, what was in the chapter and what was what things he actually said? We've been said. all over the place. Yeah, so it's hard, hard to say. But uh, the point is that the cool thing, the reason why you might want to do that is that then you can generalize this. Hey, not only do I have these embeddings for the for the movies and the users, I can also include other columns yeah. in, in addition to the embedding. I can include, like, yeah. properties of the users or things about the movies and help make better predictions that way. That's yeah. kind of, He didn't do that, but that's something he mentioned, so it would be kind of cool. Thing yeah, to at the end here is, like, even though it didn't perform as well as the other approach, it can scale with more yeah. user information. Yeah, that, yeah, so. No, I mean, I think I think we're almost at the end of the hour and you did a great job of, uh, of covering that. Uh, yeah, sure. I went through some of these, but uh, we're at the hour. If there's anything you all wanted to add, uh, we can, but otherwise, yeah, we didn't stay here all night, but uh, yeah, I wanted to make sure that we we touched on everything. And as we were going through, I realized my answers to some of the questions changed because I mixed them together. But uh, really, at the end of the day, is we're giving up a little bit of that uh, uh, the the performance for the ability to uh, uh, scale it for other. Uh, things that we want to include their users and so on. Um, and yeah, so any other key things that you would want to hear or, or want to add before we call it a night? 
No, the only other thing I would mention is that this was his last two videos have been really long because he like he didn't actually do this until like the second half of the whole video, right? <laughs> I know. Yeah, I spent a good right. while trying to figure out if I was like routed to the wrong video because of that. I was yeah. sitting there, this is, but I guess I was like and the first part was kind of interesting. It was more about more about uh, optimizing and uh, using what do you call it, gradient accumulation to try to fit your model into the memory and yeah, uh, that was a, that was a new topic for me. Uh, yeah, it was interesting, but, but I, I didn't think we needed to cover. It. I'm glad you didn't spend too much time on that here because that's not something yeah. we probably we need to talk. I, he did I, a good I, job of covering it. Let's put it that one. Um, yeah, he did then, a really good job of the uh, yeah. really breaking down in that Excel, like right yeah. here, like what cross entropy is broken in down. That part too, right? Because I mean, I've, I'm I know I'm familiar with cross entropy and softmax and that, but people who aren't, that's that's probably very useful to see that spelled out. It's kind of funny that because of the way this works, this fast AI library, that we hadn't had to talk about that yet because it just does it automatically. But then yeah. when it does this multi-target thing, where there's you, you now just have got to take the logits or the, the numbers that come out of the uh, the model and then run them into the cross entropy to finally get your um, um, loss function, right? So that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. awesome. Well, thank you all uh, for your attention and interaction. Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead and hit stop on here. Uh, okay. is, uh, have a great evening, and I guess we'll catch up next week at some point. Yeah. Hope the book yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care. Sounds good. Hope everything goes well. Presenting, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you.